I passed every round of coding interviews at Google, but then they announced a hiring freeze, so I didn't end up working at Google, but I did end up pretty decent at coding interviews. Trust me, I dare you to interview me. I dare you, please give me an interview. I studied computer science at UC Berkeley. I also did software engineering internships at Amazon, Bloomberg, Facebook, Lyft, and then I landed some big six-figure full-time offers. On top of that, I've taught, coached, and mentored people through the coding interview process, and I've seen them get offers as well. Today, I wanna to talk about specific strategies, tricks, mindsets, and thought processes that I used on the spot during my actual interviews. They worked for me, and maybe they could work for you. This will include brainstorming and planning a solution, collaborating with the interviewer and communicating your thought process, as well as working towards an optimal solution. I'll give tips for actually structuring and writing the code itself, as well as mention some common pitfalls that you should watch out for. Here we go. Here are basically all of the data structures and algorithms you should be familiar with. I'll cover each of these in detail in future videos, but today we're focusing on just doing the actual coding interview. They give you a problem, you're just staring at the problem, what do you do? First thing I would recommend you keep in mind is take way longer than you think you need to before you start coding, right? You wanna spend as much time in the collaborating with the interviewer step, the planning step, the brainstorming, writing comments and pseudo code. You wanna spend a lot of time there and you do this for a few reasons. One, your solution for most problems is gonna be what? Like 10 to 30 lines of code. Imagine you already know the solution, you know what you're gonna code. It takes you like two minutes to actually type out all the code. Yes, you will have to debug issues and handle edge cases while you're coding, but generally, right, if you can't think of your solution and plan it out and understand why it works and convince your interviewer that you know the solution, what are the chances you're suddenly gonna do all of that while you're coding? It is very difficult to multitask. Once you start typing code, you're thinking about syntax, you're thinking about your conditionals, you're thinking about how to structure your functions, right? How are you gonna do that while coming up with the solution, right? Just do one at a time. Another reason is I feel like interviewers are more likely to help you out if they understand what you're trying to do and they understand you know where you're going. If you just start coding and you don't know where it's gonna end up, the interviewer is just gonna check out. They'll just sit back and they'll be like, all right, I'll wait till he gets stuck or maybe he solves it. You don't want that to happen. You wanna keep them engaged. The next thing I would do is collect observations about the nature of the question itself, all of the edge cases and base cases that you might need to handle, right? Maybe you wanna write these out in comments, right? Because making observations is gonna help you pick up on the structure of the problem and patterns, and maybe those will lend themselves perfectly to known data structures or known algorithms. So now this part is super important, okay? the interviewer is probably gonna give you a bunch of sample inputs and a bunch of sample outputs that correspond with the inputs. And you wanna come up with a bunch of sample inputs of your own, a bunch of test cases. For basically every single problem, there is a way to manually, intuitively turn an input into a solution output. Otherwise, there would be literally no way for the interviewer or for you to verify what a correct solution might even look like. And the good news here is that if you can get an input and convert it into a solution with no code, no algorithm, then you do know an algorithm for solving the problem, right? It's just subconscious. Your brain follows algorithms whether you know it or not. Your subconscious, your intuition, it's very powerful, right? And then it just becomes a matter of mindfully asking yourself, okay, why did I make the decision that I did? What process am I intuitively following? Why did I decide to switch these two numbers and not these two numbers? And I think it's easier to think of it like this, right? You're just drawing out something you kind of feel intuitively and you're converting it into something that you can consciously step by step right out. This feels a lot more manageable than thinking of it as I'm inventing an algorithm on the spot. The next thing I would recommend is as you're planning, as you're coming up with your solution, and as you're verifying it with the interviewer, pseudocode it. Because it's really tempting to just plan a whole algorithm, ask your interviewer, oh, is this reasonable? Should I go ahead and code this? And then by the time you start coding, you got to remember everything you just walked through, right? People do things differently. This is what works for me personally. You basically want to think out loud in comments and in pseudocode, right? Just write out the steps in plain English so that by the time you start coding, 
All you have to do is just swap out every line of pseudocode and fill it in with actual code. Another thing, I personally, just my opinion, feel like most reasonable interviewers will appreciate you admitting that you don't know something, that you're not sure, showing a willingness to learn. And I think it's okay to ask, I'm not sure about this, could I get a minute to think about it? I think it's way better to have silence where you're just critically thinking rather than rambling on with a bunch of filler words where you're just distracting yourself and it's not a good look. Okay, so now, what I would do is try to get to a brute force solution. This is basically whatever is the most obvious solution, right? However you can possibly solve the problem, even if it's super inefficient. I have trouble with this because I get really ahead of myself, I get really full of myself, and I'll start thinking of these really complicated optimizations and it overcomplicates it. And then turns out the interviewer would have been perfectly happy with just the brute force solution. I'll give you an example, right? Let's say you're doing a problem where you have to count all the unique permutations of a number, right? You might think there's some crazy hack to pre-calculate this number without actually generating all the permutations. But you could start off just by saying, all right, one way to solve this is to just pick every possible number as a starting point and then recursively add on numbers until we've generated every single permutation and then just return the number of new unique ones, right? That sounds very slow. That's N squared. I can think about how to optimize this, but what do you think? Is this good enough? And the interviewer might just say, okay, that's cool. Let's code that. So then you don't have to overcomplicate it. As you can see, I'm really trying to emphasize thinking and talking about runtime and memory usage constantly, just so the interviewer knows you're thinking about efficiency but the main thing is it helps me not go in the wrong direction right let's say i look at a problem i really think about it i build this intuition that i'm pretty sure that this could be solved in n log n time i really don't see any reason why it would need to be slower than that but then i start coding and i add a loop that changes it to n squared i want to be able to catch that and be like oh we shouldn't need this let's shut it down go back to the drawing board and it saves me a lot of time I'll walk you through an example using everything I've mentioned so far. Here we have a list of meetings which are intervals of start and end times. We want the minimum number of rooms to accommodate these meetings. Right now, I kind of want to walk through some very simple example answers and see if we can pick up on any patterns. So some observations. When would the answer be zero if there's no meetings? When would the answer be one? Well, if there's only one meeting or if there's many meetings, but there's only one going on at any time. Answer would be two if there's max two meetings at any time and so on. Quick little proof by cases. So given what we've noted, we can reframe the question as the maximum number of meetings that overlap at any time. So how would we solve this intuitively? Forget the code. Imagine you're actually in an office and a supervisor gives you these meeting times and they say, hey, let me know the max number of rooms they used. You would be able to do this in person. You could just sit at your desk and as the day goes on, constantly check how many rooms are used. In real life, you would really see these meetings in chronological order. Boom, intuition. We can sort these intervals by start time so we can track all of them as the day goes on. Again, just brute force, at any start time, we could go through all of the meetings and see which meetings are going on. There we go, a brute force solution, it's a bad one, but there are things that just stick out. So we're constantly checking on rooms only because we wanna update the max so far. But the maximum number of rooms only ever changes when. It could only ever change if we're adding another room. You would only ever add a room if a new meeting is starting. When a meeting starts, well, do we need a new room? Well, first we gotta see if previously running meetings have ended by now. So we clearly need to store meetings that are currently running and we only need to know when they end, so we just store the end times. So now for our current start time we're looking at, for all the meetings that have ended by now, we'll never need to check them later on in the day, so we can remove them from where we're storing them. Boom, this screams heap. So we remove all the previous meetings, grab a room for our current one, and update our max, and what? Look at that, boom. Plug in each line there, plug in each line there, look at that. Everything was literally already there. Oh, is it too long? Just pull out the comments, bam, optimal solution. At this point, it doesn't really feel like a programming test. We're really just noticing things over and over. I encourage you to try this kind of approach for even harder problems. Some good things I like to ask, what do we actually want? Is there anything that needs to happen for us to get that? What are all the things that could affect it? What are all the possible cases of things that could happen? 
Now, let's say you get a brute force solution and you need to find a more optimal one. If there was a formula I could give you to do this in a straightforward way, companies wouldn't be doing coding interviews. It's just really tricky in general. A lot of times I'll get stuck thinking, what's a better way to solve this problem? Can I come up with a new algorithm that might be better? And then how fast is that one? Now, I've actually learned to do it kind of the opposite way. I'll actually look at my current solution and think, what is the runtime of this one? Let's say hypothetically it's n log n. And then I'll think, what is the next faster runtime? I know big O of n is a step up from n log n. What algorithms do I know already that fit linear time, big O of n? I know sliding window is generally big O of n, and I know quick select is usually n, assuming I pick good pivots. Do either of those apply to my current problem? And usually I'll make progress this way. If you're having trouble finding a solution, a lot of times it's because of the way the input is structured. You might want to think, how can I rearrange or pre-process the input differently such that it lends itself to an algorithm? Maybe you got to sort it or convert it to a new data structure. Let me show you an example. This is a leak code hard called bus routes. So you're given a list of routes and each route is itself a list with a bunch of numbers which represent bus stops. So you're trying to go from one source bus stop to a target bus stop and you're trying to find the minimum number of buses that you need to get from source to target. Now, we know that breadth first search does for sure give you a shortest path between two nodes in an undirected graph. But if you look at the way the input is structured, this lends itself to a graph where the bus stops are the nodes. So if we ran BFS on this, it would give us the minimum number of bus stops to get from source to target. But we don't care about the number of bus stops. We want the minimum number of buses or routes. We could handle this by doing some really complicated modifications to breadth first search. Essentially, in our BFS queue, we would normally just track the nodes of the graph, which are the stops. But now for this problem, we would need to track combinations of stops, routes, and transfers between routes. This means you might also revisit nodes from different routes, which you wouldn't do in normal BFS. At this point, this is no longer traditional BFS, so we can no longer rely on the guarantees of correctness and optimality that BFS has. A better way to do this would be to convert this from a graph of bus stops to a graph of routes, and two routes are connected if they share a common bus stop. And now that we have this kind of a graph, we can just run breadth for search as it normally is, and we know that it works. Key point here is, we can either modify an algorithm to fit the data structure or modify the data structure to fit the algorithm. Second method usually isn't as obvious, but it's super useful. So now we get to actually writing the code. You wanna start really broad and then fill in the details later. There's this concept called the single responsibility principle. And what that means is that each function or method should really only be responsible for implementing just one thing. If you need to implement multiple things, you should split it into different function calls. A big reason you do this is just in case you run out of time. If I'm gonna run out of time, I would rather show that I outlined and pretty much coded out the entire solution, but I missed some really boring implementation details versus implementing some really tedious function and missing out on the rest of the overall solution. Generally using abstraction and SRP, it does make it easier to test with print statements. It makes your code more readable. And also it's good practice in software development. It allows you to do mock tests and also separate functionalities into different API calls, but you'll likely not do that in an interview. When I give any of these tips, I mean, use them just to the extent that they don't slow you down and they don't make your code performance less optimal. I'll show you an example with Elite Code Hard. We're basically gonna reverse a linked list except K nodes at a time. Of course, I'm writing out my intuitive approach. While I still have nodes to reverse, I'm gonna get the next K nodes, reverse that sublist, and move on and just reassign the pointers. That's basically the solution. Tricky part is basically handling all of the pointers and the references. It's really hard if you do it like this. You raw dog it, all in one chunk, you're trying to do black belt pointer jujitsu. Boom, error, how are you debugging this? I would write it like this. Yes, it is longer, but it exactly follows the steps that I outlined earlier. It is not confusing. Just my opinion, and boom, there we go. Now let's talk about naming and readability. Sometimes you'll see code like this. Sure, this is really concise, but the function name, the variable names, all these one-liners, I don't know what I'm looking at. What does this do? 
This is still valid though. There are reasons to write code like this, like in competitive programming where all you really need is speed. But I would rather have an interviewer read this. Exact same problem, exact same solution. But it's more readable, and I feel less likely to mess up the coding or have a logic error when the code looks like this. The function name tells you exactly what this does, and the variable names are descriptive, they tell you exactly what they mean. And the formatting of the code follows the actual logic. I wanna finish off this video by talking about something that's extremely important, and it's probably the most underappreciated or neglected parts of this whole process. How are you yourself as a person showing up to this interview? How are you managing your motivation, your confidence, and your mental health throughout the interview process? It's a grueling process, not just the interview day, but the weeks or the months leading up to an interview. For me personally, as an example, let's say I have an interview coming up. I'll try my very best not to let this interview be the only thing I have going for me in my life. I'll try to keep up with the sport, keep going to the gym, make sure I'm socializing with friends, try dating someone new, try playing a video game, get into a new show, right? If this is the only thing you're anticipating, it's gonna put way too much pressure on it, right? I wanna come into an interview feeling like, okay, I would really like this job, but if I don't get it, I can walk away and I'm doing fine. And that gives you confidence to be really self-assured during the actual interview. What kind of problems should you do leading up to the interview? This isn't super common advice that I've seen, but for me personally, for the last day or two days or three days even leading up to the interview, I wanna steer clear of doing any ridiculously hard problems that I likely can't solve. I wanna avoid doing really high pressure mock interviews. Sure, maybe before that for the weeks prior, I challenge myself. I do some crazy DP, some crazy graph traversals, but I don't wanna walk into the interview on what feels like a losing streak. If I'm failing hard problem after hard problem after hard problem, then when I get a problem in the interview, my first thought is I'm gonna fail this like all the others, right? I try to go in feeling like I'm used to handling whatever's in front of me. Another thing is you wanna avoid cramming in the last 24 hours of the interview. Every second, every hour of studying does count, but in the last 24 hours, there are things that count way more. Let's say in the last day, I cover an extra two or three, or maybe four leak code problems. That probably helped, but then I show up to the interview, my attention is a little bit scattered, I'm a little bit burned out, I'm a little bit tired or demotivated, my performance plummets. It's like I climbed two steps up the stairs and then fell down the staircase. But let's say instead I got a lot of sleep, took a nap if I needed to, had a video call with a friend, spent time on a creative outlet, I cooked a really nice meal that I like, and I'm feeling good. What would you rather have? One hour to maybe cover one new lead code problem before the interview, or get in a light to a moderate workout that's gonna give you mental clarity, it's gonna give you motivation, give you energy, give you stability in your mood, and so on, right? A lot of bang for your buck there. At the end of the day, coding interviews, they are just this arbitrary puzzle game. It's kind of like the SAT or the MCAT or the LSAT. It's not meant to be a perfect representation of how you are on a day-to-day -day basis, on a job, or on a project. Unfortunately, companies just need some way to interview people in a way that's practical for them, efficient for them, and standardized across people. And I guess this is the best way that people have come up with. So while this is the standard, I guess it is what it is. Gotta do what we gotta do. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. I had so much fun making this video. Make sure to give this a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you want to see more videos, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck on your interviews.